uh, chairing the sessions will be Dr. Sarvana Kumar, Dr. Madhuravalli Thambi, and Dr. Lakshmi Ji. May I invite on stage Dr. Lakshmi Ji? She's the ad additional professor of physiology. She's also the IMA Women's Wing past chairperson. She works at Trivandrum Medical College. May, all, may I also invite Dr. Madhuravalli Thambi? She's a senior consultant gynecologist. She works at Lords and Kim's Hospital. She has her own consultancy uh, at uh, Kulatur Junction for infertility. Welcome, ma'am. May I also invite on stage Dr. Saravana Kumar. He's the assistant professor of obstetric and gynecology. He's the superintendent at the Paripalli Medical College, Kolam. Over to the chair. Topic given for me is how to screen for gynecological cancers. So as you all know, the main uh, gynecological cancer which can be screened is cervical cancer. As you all know, among these three gynecological cancers, cervical cancer is the one which is amenable to effective screening and treatment. Because uh, we know the natural history of the disease, we have simple tests which can be used for detecting precancerous lesions and there is effective treatment modalities, simple modalities are available. And if you look into the cancer burden, globally, as per uh, Globacan 2018, cervical cancer uh, ranks the fourth in the list among the female cancers, first being breast. And uh, when you look into the statistics in India, it ranks second in the list, constituting about 16.5% of female cancers. And the age standardized incidence rate is around 22 per 100,000 which is the highest in South, East, South Asian countries. And uh, the most important thing is more than 50% of these patients are dying of the disease and uh, the age standardized mortality rate is around 12 per 100,000. And why uh, cervical cancer remains as the major public health problem in India is there is no organized screening program implemented till now. We are trying to follow the foreign guidelines but we can't implement it in this country why? Because India is a vast country with a vast diversity in social, cultural and religious practices which will cause differences in the clinical practice and the patient, uh, these women may not be accessible to the medical care available. Moreover, there is no uniform availability of the screening and treatment facilities. And along with that, there is shortage of experts in this field of screening. And here comes the need to develop a good clinical practice recommendation which can be implemented in country like India. This is done by Foxy and it is published in 2018 which is evidence based. The important thing is the evidence is taken from the Indian context and uh, these recommendations is applicable to all possible clinica clinical situations in India, anywhere in India. And it gives emphasis on the adequate treatment and follow up of each screen positive patient. That is the main point of uh, effective screening. Whenever you are finding out any screen positive cases, these patients should be treated. Then only we can reduce the mortality associated with cervical cancer. So what is more important is this Foxy, as rec uh, Foxy recommendation says we can use whichever modality is available in your area. So whatever facilities are available, you can use it for screening and whatever facilities are available for treating that precancers, you can use that. And uh, these are the three uh, tests which can be used for cervical cancer screening. That is uh, by this Foxy recommendation. That is cytology. You all know about the cytology. It can be conventional cytology or liquid-based cytology. The sensitivity is equal for both. HPV DNA test and visual inspection after acetic acid. And for many HPV DNA tests are available in the market, but these are the only FDA approved HPV DNA tests. You can see DNA tests can identify the high risk group and they can genotyping. In some of the tests, you can identify the specific 16 and 18. Among this, COBAS HPV test is recognized as the best test when used for a primary screening. And for all practical purposes, Foxy has divided the healthcare system into two settings. 
that is uh, good with a good resource setting and limited resource setting, depending upon the modality available or the uh, treatment facility available. So the, uh, regarding the method of screening, primary HPV testing, if it is available, primary HPV testing should be done. Or you can do core testing along with the cytology. Or if it is not available, cytology. Or if it is not available, colposcopy biopsy or VAA. That depends upon the availability of the uh, screening test which is available to UR setting. But coming to the limited resource setting, you may not be able to do primary SPV testing or cytology. Then you can go for VAA or if colposcopy is available, colposcopy and biopsy. And the target age group is in good resource setting, you have to start screening at 25 years. And limited resource setting, you can extend to up to 30 years. You can start from 30 years and uh, up to 65 years, it should be continued for both settings. And coming to the frequency, when you are using HPV DNA test as a primary test or along with cytology, whenever you are using a prime, uh, HPV test, uh, if it is negative, you can forget about the patient for uh, next five years. And uh, if in good resource setting, you can call her, call her for uh, further testing after five years. But uh, if you are uh, proceeding with the cytology, then the interval should be three years. So HPV test, five years. and. Uh, uh, core testing or cytology, it will be three years. And when to stop? Ideally, the, it should be continued up to 65 years, irrespective of the resource setting. And in an, uh, a limited resource setting, you can use uh, VAA and uh, you can uh, do screening at least three times uh, in the lifetime. Means uh, between 30 years and 65 years, at least three VAA should be done. And uh, there is evidence to say that at least one screening test between 30 and 45 years can reduce the mortality by 30 to 35 years. So whenever you are seeing a lady, uh, more, uh, after 30 years, at least do a VAA if the other facilities are not available. And um, whenever there is a screen, screen test is positive, you have to treat it. So screen test positive means you have to do colposcopy and biopsy, directed biopsy to get reports. And the treatment will depend upon whether it is a high risk um, lesion or a low risk lesion. And when you treat the lesion, then this patient should be followed up for 20 years, irrespective of the treatment. Whenever this, this is positive, either treated or not treated, it should be for 20 years. So if you are doing hysterectomy for a CAN case, that patient should undergo further screening up to 20 years from starting from the site of um, uh, time of surgery. Then how will you choose appropriate screening modality? That depends upon whichever is available in your setting. If you are using a cytology as a screening modality, then just you find out whether this is a good quality cytology. If it is good quality cytology, then find out uh, if your hospital or your patient is affordable to SPV DNA test. Because now the primary this thing should be SPV DNA test. So you are using cytology, find out whether you can afford uh, patient can afford uh, SPV DNA testing, then switch over to SPV DNA test. If uh, it is not available, you can continue with the cytology. If both are not available, at least do a VAA. And if VAA positive, then you can proceed as like if it is positive, colposcopy, biopsy, and like that. If the facility is not available, you just refer the patient where the colposcopy is available. And uh, screen positive means cytology positive. As I already told, it can be a low grade lesion or a high grade lesion. Low grade lesion, uh, up to 30 years, you can keep the patient under follow for one or two years. High grade lesion, you have to treat. And uh, VA also, same as cytology, positive means uh, colposcopy biopsy, negative means uh, you can uh, recall the patient after three years, three or five years. Then uh, what will you do when the SPV test is positive? In the SPV test, when you do a SPV testing for a patient, you can get us two scenarios. It is either negative or it is positive. Negative means forget about the patient for five years. Positive means then you have to triage those patients. The triaging can be either done by detecting HPV 16 and 18, that is the high risk group, or you can do a cytology, or you can do a VAA, whichever is available to your setting. HPV 16 and 18, if it is positive, then send the patient for colposcopy and uh, um, again, similar procedure will be done. And uh, also cytology also positive, if low grade, then uh, one year you can keep the patient under follow up and repeat HPV test. VA also, if it is negative, repeat HPV. So whenever HPV test is positive and the triage test is negative, then you have to repeat HPV test to one year. 
Next is how will you follow up the patient with a, when you do core testing. Core testing means HPV and uh, cytology. So you can get three scenarios, both negative, forget about the patient for five years. HPV positive means it will be same as the primary HPV testing, triage the patient. And uh, if the HPV negative and cytology positive, that you should be careful. If cytology is low grade lesion, again you can keep the patient for follow up for one year, repeat HPV test. And if it is a high grade lesion, then the patient should be sent for colposcopy. And this is another scenario you will get with a cytology report. You will get abnormal glandular cells in the cytology specimen. Then you should think of uh, many possibilities. So lesion can be in the endoservice, can be in the endometrium, or it can be in the uh, fallopian tube or ovary, so that you have to find out. So uh, if uh, the cytologist is saying it is endocervical type, then you can do colposcopy. If no lesion is there, then you have to go for a diagnostic colonization. And if it is of endometrial type, then you have to go for an endometrial biopsy. If no lesion in endometrium or endocervice, then you have to evaluate the ovary or fallopian tube by doing in some imaging. So whenever uh, you are getting a colposcopy biopsy as uh, CIN, then the treatment, you have to treat the patient. Uh, that depends upon high-grade lesion or low-grade lesion. High-grade lesion, better to go for a excisional procedure and low-grade lesion, better go, go for a, you can go for a ablative bar excisional procedure. So when you do screening and uh, when you have to treat the patient, that patient has to come to your clinic in multiple times. So some of the patient may not be compliant. You may lose the patient for follow up. Here comes the approach of single visit. So single visit means usually it was done in colposcopy clinic. But when you are, uh, you are getting in the colposcopy clinic, you will be getting the patient with a cytology positive. So the cytology, the specificity, specificity is so high, so that uh, you can think that uh, this patient is having some abnormality in the cervix. So you do colposcopy and find out uh, you can grade the d uh, disease, it is high grade or low grade. If it is a high grade disease, uh, that sitting itself with a cytology report of high grade lesion, you can do a excision procedure. Or it can be uh, better to go for an excision procedure in high grade lesion. But uh, if you have a facility to take biopsy, take biopsy and you can go for a ablative procedure also. And uh, it is in colposcopy clinic. The other set, uh, thing is screen and treat. Here uh, this is done usually in public health program. Here what they are doing is do BAA. Then if it is positive, then that patient can be treated at that point itself. So that the patient may not have to come back again. So usually in public health program, better to go for ablative procedure, not an excision procedure. So this is to summary, uh, this is the summary of the Foxy good clinical practice recommendation. That's all about the cervical cancer screening. Number now about uh, endometrial cancer screening. Uh, there is no recommendation for endometrial cancer screening in general population. And you will come across one scenario where the patients are taking tamoxifen. That is the commonest thing you will come across. Remember, there is no need for going for endometrial biopsy in an asymptomatic patient which is on, who is on tamoxifen. Intervene with the invasive procedure only when the patient becomes symptomatic. So you have to counsel the patient regarding the risk associated with the tamo uh, tamoxifen to the patients and tell them to come back to you whenever they become symptomatic. And the screening is advisable for Lynch syndrome, that is a hereditary non polyposis colorectal carcinoma with increased risk of endometrial cancer. These patients can be either kept for surveillance or you can give chemo prevention or you can advise risk reducing surgery. So, for endometrial cancer, the screening recommended is annual endometrial sampling 30 to 35 years or 5 to 10 years prior to any malignancy in that family. And for premenopausal patients, endometrial sampling is preferred than transvaginal sonography. But postmenopausal patients, you can first do TBS and if needed, you can go for endometrial biopsy. It's also about ovarian cancer screening. It is many screening tests which can be used are CA125, TBS and multimodal screening. That is CA125 plus transvaginal sonography. It is not at all recommended for a general population. 
and uh, high risk patients with breast cancer ovarian syndrome and uh, hereditary non polyposis colony you can uh, screen the patient with uh, annual pelvic examination and ca 125 and transvaginal sonography 6 to 12 months and you can advise risk reducing surgery whenever they complete family and advise chemo prevention also thank you name the pri primary hpv dna test which can be used for cervical cancer screening answer has already come in <laughs> That is COBAS HPV DNA test because it uh, detects the 16 and 18. So that's the uh, test which can be used for primary screening when you use it alone. The other tests are used for code testing along with the cytology. A 31 year old with a code testing report of cytology, ASCUS and uh, HPV DNA test in negative. What will you do? Repeat code testing at once. Thank you, Dr. Sujeda, for the excellent uh, presentation. Uh, now I invite uh, Dr. Vinod Thank you. For, for the topic uh, recurrent UTA and how to manage. As you know, recurrent urinary tract infection is very common nowadays, whether you are a uh, gynecologist or a urologist. It's a very common diso uh, disorder which has to be treated effectively. Thank you. Respected persons, respected seniors and my dear friends. First of all, let me thank Dr. Anupama and uh, Dr. Sriyumar for giving me that, this wonderful opportunity to be with you, to interact with you on this interesting and common topic. So first of all, let me tell you clearly that this is going to be a 2020 match where you have only 20 minutes and you have a lot of things to be done, a lot of things to be discussed. So just glue your ears for another 20 minutes so that I can go out of the podium in 15 minutes. So there is a disclaimer. As mentioned in my invitation, Dr. Anubama has clearly written it should be a practical thing and you should not talk too much theory. So it is not an evidence-based discussion. It is based on my uh, uh, experience in my preventive urology clinic in my clinic which is cure and you may consider it as an expert opinion and if you want you can consider it as an inexpert opinion and just uh, uh, avoid this but one thing I can clearly tell you you can practice with confidence because I have results but quote with caution because there are many things which are just practical So I won't be going through the theory of recurrent UTA because you will all be aware of this. I'll be taking three clinical scenarios. One is a female child and adolescence. Then you have the uh, old females. Then you have the young female. So I'll take the young female to, the, to be the first and discuss the concept, then we will take the special situation in a child, adolescent and in a old female. So when I get a patient, a young female with recurrent UTI, the whenever we ask the patient, what is your problem? The answer will be, I am having recurrent UTI. So they will not be divulging any of their symptoms or they were hesitant to tell you what are the symptoms. So my first clinical question is, is she suffering from a UTI or not? So why I am bothered about this? Because the symptomatology is very important because as a urologist, I am thinking of many other conditions which can have the same symptomatology of UTI. So my first question is whether it is a UTI or not. So I will be seeing the symptomatology once again. Second, I will see, I will look for a documented significant pyuria. It has to be documented from a good lab. It has to be significant, like it's not one to two puzzles or three to four puzzles. It has to be something like six to eight or more than eight or more than 10. And look for a cultural positivity. One document of culture positivity because we are dealing with recurrent UTIs. 
then i may be prob- probably exclude things like a sterile pyuria or an asymptomatic bacteria so that is my aim so i just want to see i am dealing with a recurrent uti and not something else my second clinical question will be i want to typify what is the recurrence what is a recurrent type or is it a just a first infection i am dealing with or is it a recurrent uti at all or is it an unresolved uti you might think that unresolved uti is maybe one week old no it can be even 6 months old the same uti can be unresolved and remain like that for 6 months because of your multiple treatments and our patients are keep on rolling to different different gynecologists or urologists or general practitioners so it is a first infection or an unresolved uti or is it a real recurrent uti then i will be looking whether it is a persistent or a uti or a relapsing of the uti or is it a reinfection now my third question i know i am dealing with a recurrent uti i have typified it then my third question will be how to investigate what are the things to be done a urinalysis and a culture and sensitivity you all know then ultrasound kub with a specific specifically i will look for a post void residual urine also then of course a ct urogram you know why why we are going for a ct urogram stones pyelonephritis some other abscess and so many other things and a cystoscopy since you may not be commonly see this is a case where you you i have a patient from palgar she has rolled on to different different uh, people and have come lastly to trivandrum this is her cystoscopic finding of recurrent uti patient this is a colovesical fistula this is a colovesical fistula you can see the fecal matter in the bladder this is the area where the fecal matter is coming up and you can see some granulation tissues this is a common finding when you have a real pathology inside the bladder you will see something like this you can see the fecal matter there and you can see the i am trying to probe with a guide where whether i can demonstrate it i can dem- see a fistula there but it is not able to be probed so this is another patient recurrent uti cystoscopy now we can see one granulation area like this like this one we have seen in that colovesical fistula patient you can see this granulation area here so this will be the area where you are looking for something and if you have some patients and look look to you focus on to that area you can see the pus pouring out from a particular focus this patient unfortunately had a hernia repair and the mesh got infected and it was eroding into the bladder so this is where the cystoscopy is going to help you so we have done the investigation we have got the diagnosis clearly now our question is how to manage it before managing it one word of one more clinical question to me is how what are the host factors to be addressed where we have to uh, which are the things we we have to address along with this uti one is diabetes mellitus many patients have this gynecological infections this can lead to recurrent uti so we need the gynecology help for uh, managing such patients then sexual activity of the patient some of the uh, uti may be due to postcoital infections so you have to get a clear history of its relation to sexual activity then bowel problems both constipation and loose stools can create problems estrogen depletion like a patient with a post hysterectomy estro estro uh, post oophorectomy then we really want to see how this patient was mismanaged not mismanaged i, I, I may not use that term how antimicrobial overuse was there in this particular patient so that also helps to help you to choose the antibiotic then the residual urine and incontinence so these are the host factors i will check and the fourth clinical question is now i will which antibiotic to be chosen first empirical 
because my patient has come to me i want to have a empirical antibiotic which empirical antibiotic has to be chosen it based it is based on the local antibiogram it could be your hospital's antibiogram or your particular city's antibiogram you can choose on uh, which is what is available why you want an antibiogram because the basic principle of choosing an antibiotic empirical antibiotic is it should be susceptible for 80% of the bacteria in your particular area in your hospital or in your area so you have to choose an antibiotic like that and it should have a less collateral damage what is a collateral damage suppose you are giving an antibiotic it is having a lot of environmental side effects so we don't want to use an antibiotic to our patient and create a problem in the environment so it should have a less collateral damage and it should be based on your antibiotic policy your antibiotic policy or your hospital's antibiotic policy or your state's antibiotic policy that depends so these are the the uh, uh, points which help me to choose the empirical antibiotic and now we are seeing a lot of multi drug resistant organisms and even the government and uh, the media are telling that the doctors are overusing the antimicrobials and creating the uh, re uh, resistance but unfortunately it is not the only reason we have so many other reasons like the there are many industries producing antibiotics the unused antibiotics are thrown away disposed the proper biomedical disposal is not there the excess of antibiotics being used in the hospitals are put just into the drain not properly disposed even the antibiotics we buy in our our own home they are not properly used the veterinary surgeons are using lot of antibiotics so all these are going into the community it is not the doctors alone is creating the multi multi drug resistance so my choice will be phosphomycin to start with second option will be nitrofurantoin third cephalosporins and fourth quinolones these are the dosage schedules now after two days you will get the culture then i will shift to the culture sensitive antibiotics most of the time you you know that it will be sensitive to parenteral antibiotics so in such patients i will opt for a outpatient parenteral antibiotic treatment we don't prefer to put the patient inside the hospital because I, we don't want the multi drug resistant organism to multiply in, inside our hospital and monitor the rft when when you are using aminoglycosides and monitor the response by urinalysis and other parameters and sometimes you can use oral counterparts it is less available but commonly i use a cefixin clavulanic acid combination and it usually works now go to the follow up protocol this is basically a protocol based on guidelines and we have uh, uh, formulated a protocol a follow up protocol that is the very important thing in management of recurrent uti once you finish the antibiotics and the patient is completely free prove it by a sterile culture and you do a periodic anal urine analysis and see whether the infections are coming back or not you study that natural history of that particular infection and go for a profile axis could be behavioral like lot of water uh, hygienic habits and other things cranberry demanos and antibiotics these are the prophylactic antibiotics now we have two more minutes and we will just quickly go through these two scenarios a child and an adolescent female the special considerations are the congenital problems has to be addressed in a child even in adolescents like a vesicular uric reflux pug obstruction neurogenic problems then comes a dysfunctional elimination syndrome where you have a patient with avoiding dysfunction coming up uh, in uh, when the, in their when they have the toilet training even lazy voiders are there especially in uh, adolescent females then personal and social problems like pa children on diapers uh, adolescents who are studying they they don't have a good toilet in their uh, uh, workplace or in their schools or colleges so these are the special considerations we have to think about then comes the third scenario where you have a old lady with the same problems your approach is basically the same the special consideration should be they, they may be estrogen depleted they may have immobility they may have catheters they may have neurologic problems 
and they may have many other comorbidities so to summarize first of all my first of all my aim will be to define the problem typify the prove that it is tti typify the problem identify the host factors then based on our antibiotic policy we treat the patient and put the patient on a good follow up program which is very strict and patient should be compliant and that will be the story of success thank you okay thank you very much thank for you for your presentation but uh, usually all doctors including me if coming with a dysuria we are uh, not uh, asking them to do the urine routine microscopic but they are not bothering about the ph of the urine routine and uh, without noticing or most of the prescriptions i am seeing they are in, uh, random they are giving alkali alkasol so if the alkali is the alkasol is the uh, uh, alkali and uh, what is, what is your opinion of giving again alkasol but first of all let me confess that i, I will never give an alkali sir yes. for a patient because it has no role to play in the management of uti except for some some symptomatic uh, uh, advantage which may be some few hours because if you give a proper antibiotic within hours the symptoms will disappear so i never give alkali and i don't recommend alkali so i have thank you very much because we are usually see i am usually saying and without uh, an um, any thinking of anything that they are giving alkasol is it so thank you Uh, thank you, Dr. Vinod. Uh, actually, uh, it was a 2020 match presentation, but it had given a complete overview of uh, how to uh, manage a recurrent UTI infection. Thank you. Now the topic is open for discussion. Any questions from the audience? Dr. Sridhar, what is your opinion about? Uh hpv vaccination and how effective it is and uh, what is your recommendation so there is um, adequate evidence to say that uh, hpv vaccine is effective it gives protection to means uh, whichever vaccine we are using uh, now it is available we have nonovalent vaccine if it is available nonovalent vaccine is there if it is available that should be given to girls between 9 to 14 years We, we can use bivalent also, but the best thing is nonovalent. But in India, it has not come. It is recommended. No, nothing to say that it should not be used. What about the contravalent vaccine? The contravalent is usually given for male patients. That six and eleven so females. We are recommending bivalent or nonovalent. And after the treatment of CAN two or three ablation or uh, excision. you follow up the patient the same as the screening only you have to follow up the patient with the if whatever facility is available for you if cytology is available on in 3 as you can do cytology if hpv dna test is available that is not all practical but whatever is available you can do vaa so up to 20 years starting from the treatment you have to continue screening with the permission of the chair may I maybe wind up the session sir we'll have to move forward to the chairperson thank you chairperson thank, 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 thank you for thank you madams and sirs we have just come to the end of session 4 over to felicitations i request dr madhravali tambi to present the memento to dr sucheta s and i request dr sharvan kumar and dr lakshmi ji to present the memento to dr vinod kv Thank you. I now invite Dr. C. Nirmala to give the uh, to present the memento to the chairpersons, Dr. Madhuravali Tambi, and Dr. Sharvan Kumar. And now I request Dr. Anupama Ramachandran to present the memento to Dr. C. Nirmala.
we'll be announcing the winners of the question and answer session now i request dr anupama ramachandran to give away the prize money to the winners question number 6 the winner dr sujisha ss and question number 8 the winner dr deepa arnayar congratulations to all the winners